Welcome back to Honors Calculus. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of continuity on an interval with some properties of continuous functions. This lesson is the crunchiest thing that we do in this course. There are some very technical theorems that we want to talk about, which take their existence to the completeness axiom that we talked about in the last video. So this is going to be a place where I'm going to strongly encourage you to take a look at the typed notes for the lesson. I am certainly not going to go through all of the details in all of the proofs that I've typed out, but I want to give you some idea of why these properties rely on completeness. Before I get there, let me get my head out of the way, and let's talk a little bit about what it means to be continuous on an interval. Remember our definition is that a function is continuous at a point C if and only if the limit as X approaches C of F of X is equal to F of C. Expanding this definition out, our goal here is not to look at con continuity at a point, but continuity on an interval. We'll say that the function is continuous on an open interval from A to B, if and only if F is continuous at each point C in that open interval. Right. Continuity on an open interval is pretty easy to work with. Um, very often, we're going to be looking at functions that are continuous everywhere. And when we say everywhere, we mean all real numbers, the interval from negative infinity to infinity. Some sources call this continuous everywhere. Some sources call this everywhere continuous. Those two things mean the same thing. And if we just say that F is continuous, this is what we are talking about. Right. Those properties aren't too bad. The place where things get confusing is if you want to look at a closed interval. Because the key of a closed interval is that we don't care what happens just outside the interval. Right? Point A could be a jump discontinuity or even a removable discontinuity. I'm sorry, not point A itself, but point A could be, yeah, point A could be on one side of a jump discontinuity and the function might still be continuous on an interval starting at A even though the function is not continuous at A. So for F to be continuous on the closed interval from A to B, we're going to insist on three things. Right. 
we're going to insist that f is continuous on the open interval. So on every c in the open interval from a to b. And at point a, we're going to insist that the limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x is equal to f of a. From the left, we don't care because the left is outside the interval. And the opposite on the other endpoint, the limit as x approaches b from the left, which is approaching from within the interval, but not from the right, which would be outside the interval. So for example, if we consider the function, say f of x is one, for zero less than x less than five, and two for five is less than or equal to x. Clearly this function is discontinuous at x equals five. but the function is still continuous on the closed interval from five to wherever we want to go. I went from five to infinity because I'm crazy like that. Right. The fact that five is a jump discontinuity, well, f of five is two, and the limit as x approaches five from the right, where f is always two, is also going to be two. So on that side, it's fine. Uh, let's not start at zero. This function is not actually defined on zero. Let's start at one. Right. If you look at the interval from one to five, in the open interval between one and five, this function is continuous. At x equals one, this function is continuous. So it's continuous on the... Um, close the interval starting at one, but at five, the limit from the left is going to be one, the value of the function is going to be two, they don't agree, so this function is not continuous on an interval that ends at five on the right. It's continuous on any interval that begins at five on the left. I encourage you, if you're not quite sure about that, to write out the details and make sure that that makes sense to you. I want to get into our theorems. There are four theorems I'm going to be proving here. We're going to start with Bolzano's theorem. We're also going to look at the intermediate value theorem. We're going to look at the boundedness theorem. And we're finally going to look at the extreme value theorem. All right, I'm going to put an asterisk on Bolzano's theorem and on the boundedness theorem. Those two theorems are fairly difficult to work with. They're technically challenging. The intermediate value theorem and the extreme value theorem are not straightforward, but natural consequences of the first two. And we'll get into these one by one. I'll talk about them in a lot more depth. I've gone blurry again. Let's see if I can get this thing to focus on me. Every now and then, if I just change windows on my computer, it will decide 
that yeah, it actually does want to focus. I think that actually helped. Yeah, that helped. Not perfect, but it helped. And it's gone again, of course. All right. Um, anyway, uh, these four theorems are all going to be examples of what I call existence theorems. Each of the four theorems is going to tell us that a feature exists in a continuous function or a function continuous on a closed interval. It's not going to give us any indication of how to get there. And that's okay. We're going to use the fact that these features exist. Specifically, we're going to use the fact that an intermediate value and an extreme value exist to allow us to perform some very useful ideas that are going to be the foundations of calculus for us, or the foundations of the applications of calculus. So just knowing that when a function is continuous on a closed interval, these features exist, allow us to perform calculus on functions and know that nothing is going to break. And that's what we're looking at here. That's what we're looking for. So let me get my head back out of the way and let's state some of these theorems. The other thing I want you to notice as you look at these theorems is that the results should seem fairly obvious. Bolzano's theorem, which I call a lemma in the typed notes. Remember, a lemma is a theorem which is, generally speaking, awkward. But knowing that the lemma is true makes it so that we can get the theorem to also be true without a tremendous amount of additional work. So a lemma is a great stepping stone to getting a theorem. Bolzano's theorem is a great lemma to getting the intermediate value theorem. So let's let f be a continuous function, continuous on a closed interval from a to b, specifically where the endpoints f of a is negative, f of b is positive. And in those conditions, we can be assured that there is some point C in the middle so that F of C is equal to zero. Again, the theorem gives us no way of finding C. It just promises us that it's there somewhere. And this should make sense. If we take some a and b, so that a function is smaller than zero at a and larger than zero at b, the theorem is telling us there is no way for the function to be continuous and get from here to there without crossing through zero. I mean, our classic understanding of continuous as you can't draw the line without, or you can draw the line without lifting your pencil is enough for us to intuitively say that yes, that must be the case. But intuitively say is no longer good enough. That's the whole point of honors calculus is to get rid of intuitively say and turn it into concretely say. So we want to prove this. And we're going to prove this 
by considering a set. Let's let S be the set of anything in the interval from A to B such that F of X is less than or equal to zero. I make the innocuous remark that this set is bounded above by B. Clearly it's bounded above because every value is in the interval from A to B. So before we even look at the condition of F of X is less than or equal to zero, we stop at the condition of X is in the closed interval from A to B. That means that X is less than B, less than or equal to B. X is also greater than or equal to A. Right. Again, not necessarily the least upper bound, but an upper bound. And because it, this set S is bounded above, we can conclude that the least upper bound of S exists and let's call that least upper bound C. Because this is a continuous function, we know that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. And using the limit definition, or the epsilon delta definition of a limit, we can go through very carefully and construct that um, if it is not the case that f of c is zero, that it must be the case that C is not actually the least upper bound of S. If F of C is not zero, then the epsilon delta definition will give us an upper bound of S. Right? I'm not going through the detail. It fills about a page of the type notes, um, going through the algebra of why that's the case, but that's the conclusion that we make. And because C plus delta is bigger than, well, of course I screwed that up. C plus delta does in fact serve as an upper bound, but the interesting one is that C minus delta serves as an upper bound. And because C minus delta serves as an upper bound, C minus delta is smaller than the least upper bound, that's a problem. we conclude that this is a contradiction. If f of c is not zero, we get nonsense. We get that the least upper bound is larger than another upper bound. So it must be the case that f of c is zero. And that's how we prove Bolzano's theorem. The intermediate value theorem is a generalization of Bolzano's theorem.
right? So the intermediate value theorem, let's let F be continuous on a closed interval. And let's pick a number V, which is somewhere between the endpoints. The intermediate value theorem claims that there is some point in the interval so that the function hits that value in there. Once again, this is something that makes a lot of sense. If I have my endpoints A and B, and I have my value in question V, because the function is continuous, there is no way to get from here to there without crossing through and hitting that value at least once. In this particular picture, I hit it three times. And again, intuitively, it makes sense. To prove it, we have to be a little bit more careful. So the proof here Let's let g of x be either f of x minus v, if f of a is less than f of b, or let's let g of x be v minus f of x, if f of b is less than f of a. And what I want you to notice is that if f of x is equal to v, g of x is equal to zero. And if g of x is equal to zero, f of x is equal to b. And by choosing between these correctly, we get that f of a is less than zero and f of b is greater than zero because um, v is strictly between f of a and f of b. So, if f of a is the smaller one, that means that v is something bigger than it. And by subtracting f of a minus v, we get something negative and vice versa. With that set up, we can now use Bolzano's theorem to find, oh, not f of a and f of b, g of a and g of b. We can use Bolzano's theorem to find our g of c, which is equal to zero. And from there, we get our f of c, which is equal to k. And hey, now we have proven the intermediate value theorem. Uh, again, picture makes a lot of sense. If you have a continuous curve going from a high point to a low point, it's got to hit every point in the middle somewhere. It's obvious, it makes a ton of sense. It is incredibly difficult to prove and proving it requires this idea of completeness.
All right. The boundedness theorem says let's take a function which is continuous on a closed interval from A to B. The theorem states that this function is also bounded on that interval. And we talked about what it means for a set to be bounded. For a function to be bounded, what I'm talking about is the set of all y such that y equals f of x for some x in a, B. This set is bounded. Right? The set of all output values of the function where the domain is restricted to A, B. And once again, we prove this by constructing very carefully a set and using it to um, see that we can find an upper or lower bound and those upper and lower bounds must exist and translate out from there. From there, I'll take you to the extreme value theorem. The extreme value theorem tells us that if a function is continuous on a closed interval, then that function achieves its maximum and its minimum. By the boundedness theorem, we can be assured that the set is bounded. It has an upper bound, it has a lower bound. Because it is a set of real numbers, it has a least upper bound and it has a greatest lower bound. The extreme value theorem takes this a step further and tells us that that uh, least upper bound is actually met. There is a value where you take f of c and you get that least upper bound. And there is a value where you take f of d and you get that greatest lower bound. Once again, we do that by relying on the completeness of the real numbers to construct a set and see that um, it would be absolutely nonsense if this didn't happen. We'll come back to the extreme value theorem later on in the course. Identifying extreme values is a very useful application of the derivative. For right now, the intermediate value theorem is one that we can already start working on. So the intermediate value theorem 
Remember the intermediate value theorem says that if you have a function which is continuous on a closed interval and you have a value which is strictly between the value of the functions at either endpoint of the closed interval, then there is a point somewhere in the interval where the function takes on that value. I have here a kind of silly example. I want to use the intermediate value theorem to argue that a sphere with a volume of 100 cubic centimeters has a radius somewhere between four centimeters and five centimeters. Now, clearly, I could simply find the formula for the volume of a sphere, which gives us a way to solve for the radius and use that to calculate the radius of a sphere with a volume of 100 cubic centimeters. That's perfectly possible, but that does not use the intermediate value theorem. So what I want you to do is think about this intermediate value theorem, think about the statement of it, and see if you can come up with a way to use that as your argument that the radius of this sphere is somewhere between four and five centimeters. It's a tricky problem, but I think that you have the tools you need to figure it out. Spend some time playing around with that one, and I'll see you in the next video.